Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bobimi. And I'm dead inside. Dead inside. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. It's just like almost there. And it's like, and then it just like. I think it's because you don't have the fear of God in you. And maybe I just don't have the, the power of God in me. Maybe that's it. I have no God power. No God church for I you. need to go refill my God power out of God church. <laughs> and welcome back to another eldest. Wow. Demi, give us a recap of what happened in the last episode. Um, Roran decided that he's a criminal now. And he's going to steal those barges from that man. And then that man said, hey, I don't want no trouble. This is fishy. Um, I didn't agree to transport people. You said it was going to be animals. And then... Roran said, I am but a shepherd for all my people. I am. <laughs> and then Roran said, also, I'll fucking cut you if you don't. Pretty much. And so now they're going to tear him. Well, Clovis, like, w- drew his blade on him. Yeah. And, and then Roran was like, I've killed so many men. He's like, you don't think I'll kill you? I could kill you in an instant, Clovis. And then you'll never see your wife and child again. He's like, I've killed 10 men. I and then that's when that's actually when Horst came up and was like, "You become a hard man, harder than I can ever be." Oh, he's so hard. He's like, "Don't lose yourself, but stay hard. Don't get lost in the sauce of your hard sauce." <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened. <clears throat> Sweet, I think that's the best recap anyone's ever done on the last chapter. It's the best yet. Nice. Oh, no. Oh, no. I was say, you know what will happen if I leave that on the ground? At the end of the chapter, I'll fucking panic and freak out looking for it. And then you'll it. yell at me and be like, where did it go? Are you sitting on it? I won't yell at you. You'll freak out. I'll just you'll panic. yell to you the words I'm trying to express. <laughs> nice. Nice. Chapter 46. The Beginning of wisdom. The days Aragon spent in Elismira blended together without distinction. Time seemed to have no hold in the Pinewood City. The season aged not, even as the afternoons and evenings lengthened, barring the forest with rich shadows. <laughs> Flowers of all months bloomed at the urging of the elves' magic, nourished by the enchantments, su- spun through the air. Aragon came to love Elismira with its beauty and its quiet the graceful buildings that flowed out of the trees, the haunting songs that echoed at twilight, the works of art hidden within the mysterious dwellings, and the introspection of the elves themselves, which they mixed with outbursts of merriment. Oh my god. I'm so homesick. For Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't to say for fucking Du Weldon Varden, Ellis Mira? Are no. you an elf? The wild animals of Du Weldon Varden had no fear of hunters. Often Aragon would look from his eerie to see an elf petting a stag or a gray fox or murmuring to a shy bear that trundled along the edge of a clearing reluctant to expose himself interesting fucking pet a bear i don't fucking think so it's interesting that i guess they have like a magical connection i guess like because they have like the mind touch or whatever oh they could yeah soothe the bear but it's kind of interesting just like that they just pet wild animals you know because even a stag like that's a dangerous animal like he could just jab your eyeballs out if he wanted i guess not if you soothe their mind enough i want to live here some here we are some animals had no recognizable form they appeared at night moving and grunting in the bushes and fleeing if aragon dared approach once he glimpsed a creature like a furred snake and once a white-robed woman whose body wavered and disappeared to a, reveal a grinning she-wolf in her place. Wait, are we talking about a totally different creature? Like, this is like a werewolf? Is this where we're going? I'm just imagining something from, like, Sabrina. <laughs> Me too, actually. Aragon and Safira continued to explore Elis Mira when they had the chance. They went alone or with Orc, for Arya no longer accompanied them, nor had Aragon spoken to her since she broke his faith. 
He saw her now and then, flitting between the trees. But whenever he approached, intending to apologize, she withdrew, leaving him alone among the ancient pines. At last, Aragon realized that he had to take the initiative if he were to ever have a chance of mending his relationship with her. So one evening, he picked a bouquet of flowers from the path by his tree and hobbled to Diodali Hall, where he asked directions to Arya's quarters from an elf in the common room. Um, maybe, okay, how, it's weird to get somebody's, like, location or address without, like, them knowing, you know? Like, she didn't give it to you for a reason. Don't go get it from people. It's weird. Yeah, I guess. I like how he threw in there hobbled because he's, like, a fucking crippled boy. He's fucked up right now. <clears throat> the screen door was open when he reached her chambers. No one answered when he knocked. He stepped inside, listening for approaching footsteps as he glanced around the spacious vine-covered living room, which opened to a small bedroom on one side and a study on the other. Two ferrets decorated the walls, a portrait of a stern, proud elf with silver hair, who Aragorn guessed was King Evendar, and that of a younger male elf, whom he did not recognize. Balen. Ooh, that's her boyfriend. Aragorn wandered through the apartment, looking but not touching, savoring his glimpse into Arya's life, gleaning what he could about her interests and hobbies. By um, her bed, he saw a glass sphere with the preserved blossom of the Black Morning Glory embedded within it. On her desk, neat rows of scrolls with titles like Ocelon, Harvest Report, and Activity, noted by Gilead Watchtower. On the sill with an open bay window, three miniature trees grown in the shape of glyphs from the ancient language. The glyphs were peaths, Peace, strength, and wisdom, and by the trees a scrap of paper with an unfinished poem, covered with crossed out words and scribbled marks. It read, she's gonna fucking read her personal poetry. Okay. I understand the like intense curiosity of like somebody so like mysterious to you and like wanting to know, and they're like, ooh, not in their room, and like what a good place to see like who they are. But like, damn, that's so creepy. Like, don't. It's an it's invasion like, what, are you of privacy. Go fucking find her underwear drawer next. You oh my god! Creep? Like, what are you a fuck? Okay, that is like stalker behavior. He got her address without her permission, went into her home while she wasn't there, and is now rifling through her things. What a fucking creep! <clears throat> Under the moon, the bright white moon, lies a pool, a flat silver pool, among the brakes and brambles, black heart pines. Falls a stone, a living stone, cracks the moon, the bright white moon, among the brakes and brambles and black heart pines. Shards of light, swords of light, ripple across the pool, the quiet mirror, the still tarn, the lonely lake there. In the night, the dark and heavy night, flutter shadows, confuse shadows, where once, going to the small table by the entrance, Aragon laid his bouquet upon it and turned to leave. He froze as he saw Arya standing in the doorway. She looked startled by his presence, then concealed her emotions behind an impassive expression. They stared at each other in silence. He lifted the bouquet, half offering it to her. I don't know how to make a blossom for you like Phaelin did, but these are honest flowers and the best I could find. I cannot accept them, Aragon. They're not, they're not that sort of gift, he paused. It's no excuse, but I didn't realize beforehand that my faith would put you in such a difficult situation. For that, I'm sorry and I cry your pardon. I was just trying to make a ferth, not cause trouble. I understand the importance of my studies, Arya, and you needn't fear I will neglect them in order to moon after you. He swayed and leaned against the wall, too dizzy to remain on his feet without support. He's, like, gonna die. D can nobody help him? Nope. <sighs> That's all. She regarded him for a long moment, then slowly reached out and took the bouquet, which she held beneath her nose. Her eyes never left his. They are honest flowers, she conceded. Her gaze flickered down to his feet and back up again. Have you been ill? No, my back. I had heard, but I did not think. He pushed himself away from the wall. I should go. Wait, Arya hesitated, then guided him to the bay window where he sat on the padded be bench that curved from the wall. Removing two, go removing two goblets from a cupboard, Arya crumbled dried nettle leaves into them and filled the goblets with water saying boil, heated the water for tea. Wow. 
could have just said magicked up some fucking nettle tea. She gave a goblet to Aragon, who held it with both hands so the warmth seeped into him. He glanced out the window to the ground 20 feet below, where elves walked among the royal gardens, talking and singing, and fireflies floated through the dusky air. <clears throat> I wish, said Aragon. I wish it could always be like this. It's so perfect and quiet. Arya stirred her tea. How fair Sephira. The same. And you? I've been preparing to return to the Varden. Alarm shot through him. When? After the blood oath celebration. I have tarried here for I have tarried here for far too long as it is, but I have been loath to leave, and Islanzani wished me to stay. Also, I have never attended a blood oath celebration, and it is the most important of our observances. She considered him over the rim of her goblet. Is there nothing Ormus can do for you? Aragon forced a wary shrug. He tried everything he knows. They sipped their tea and watched the groups and couples meander along the garden paths. Your studies go well, though? She asked. They do. In the lull that followed, Aragon picked up the scrap of paper from between the trees and examined her stanzas, as if reading them for the first time. Do you often write poetry? Arya extended her hand for the paper, and when he gave it to her, rolled it into a tube so that the words were no longer visible. It is custom that everyone who attends a blood oath celebration should bring a poem, a song, or some other piece of art that they have made and share it with those assembled. I have begun to work on mine. I think it's quite good. If you had read much poetry, I have. Arya paused, then dipped her, dipped her head and said, Forgive me, you are not the person I first met in Gilead. No, I... He stopped and twisted the goblet between his hands while he searched for the right words. Arya, you'll be leaving soon enough. I would count it a shame if this is the last I see of you between now and then. Could we not meet occasionally as we did before, and you could show Sephira and me more of Ellis Mira? It would not be wise, she said in a gentle but firm voice. He looked up at her. Must the price of our indiscretion be our friendship? I cannot help how I feel toward you but I would rather suffer another wound from Durza than allow my foolishness to destroy the companionship that existed between us. I value it too highly. Lifting her goblet, Arya finished the last of her tea before responding. Our friendship shall endure, Aragon. As for us spending time together, her lips curved with a hint of a smile. Perhaps, however, we will have to wait and see what the future brings, for I am busy and I can promise nothing. He knew her words were the closest thing to a consolation he was likely to receive, and he was grateful for them. Of course, Arius Fitkona, he said, and bowed his head. They exchanged a few more pleasantries, but it was clear that Arya had gone as far as she was willing to go that day. So Aragon returned to Sephira, his hope restored by what they had accomplished. Now it's up to fate to decide the outcome, he thought, as he settled before Oramus's latest scroll. So I know like what he means by Arya went as far as she was going to go. Like I get it, but what a weird choice of words. Like, yeah, I was think, of, like when I read that, I was like, okay, like, I don't know, like, fine, I get it. I wouldn't have written it that way because it makes it, I don't know, after like contextually, it makes it feel weird and like kind of creepy. Yeah, because he was just rifling through all her things and was just like creeping around, <laughs> you know. What a creep. Reaching into the pouch at his belt, Aragon withdrew a soapstone container of Nalgask beeswax melted with hazelnut oil <clears throat> and smeared it over his lips to protect them against the cold wind that scoured his face. He closed the pouch, then wrapped his arms around Sephira's neck and buried his face in the crook of his elbow to reduce the glare from the wimpled clouds beneath them. The tireless beat of Sephira's wings dominated his hearing, higher and faster than that of Glader's, whom she followed. They flew southwest from dawn until early afternoon, often pausing for enthusiastic sparring bouts between Sephira and Glader, during which Aragon had to strap his arms onto the saddle to prevent himself from being thrown off by the stomach-turning acrobatics. He then would free himself by pulling on slip knots with his teeth. The trip ended... You think magic would have an application there? Nah, there's no words in the ancient language to do... Instead of, like, ripping off his slip knots, he'd be like, bing bong, and then they would just, like, <laughs> fall off. The trip ended at a cluster of four mountains that towered over the forest. The first mountains Aragon had seen in Dewald and Varden, white-capped and windswept, 
they pierced the veil of clouds and bared their creviced bro brows to the beating sun, which was heatless at such altitude. It looks so small compared to the Beors, said Zephira. <clears throat> as, be as had become his habit during weeks of meditation, Aragon extended his mind in every direction, touching upon the consciousnesses around him in search of any who might mean him harm. He felt a marmot warm in her burrow, ravens, nut hatches and hawks, numerous squirrels running among the trees, and farther down the mountain, rock snakes undulating through the brush in search of mice that was their prey, as well as the hordes of ubiquitous insects. When Glader descended to a bare ridge on the first mountain, Saphira had to wait until he folded his massive wings before there was enough room for her to land. The field of boulder-strewn talus they alighted upon was a brilliant yellow from a coating of hard, crenulated lichen. Above them loomed a sheer black cliff. It acted as a buttress and dam for a cornice of blue ice that groaned and split under the wind, losing jagged slabs that shattered on the granite below. This peak is known as Fianula, said Glader, and her brothers are Ethrundor, Marogovin, and Grimmensmal. Each has its own tale, which I shall recount on the flight back. Oh. But for now, I shall address the purpose of this trip. Namely, the nature of your bond forged between dragons and elves, and later, humans. You both know of it, and I have hinted at its full implications to Sephira, but the time has come to learn the solemn and profound meaning of your partnership, so that you may uphold it when Oromus and I are no more. Master? asked Aragon, wrapping his cloak around himself to stay warm. Yes, Aragon. Why is Oromus not here with us? Because, rumbled Glader, it is my duty, as was always the duty of an elder dragon in the centuries past, to ensure that the newest generation of riders understands the true importance of the station they have assumed, and because Ormus is not as well as he appears. The rocks cracked with muffled reports as Glader coiled up, nestling himself among the scree and placing the ma his majestic head upon the ground lengthwise to Aragon and Saphira. He examined them with one gold eye as large as a polished round shield and twice as brilliant. A gray smudge of smoke drifted from his nostrils and was blown to tatters by the wind. Parts of what I'm about to reveal were common knowledge among the elves, riders, and learned humans, but much of it was known only to the leader of the riders. Wait, I thought he just said it was common knowledge. Like, much of it was common knowledge, but some was only known to the leader? Mm. I don't know. A mere handful of elves, the humans, current potent, potent, potentate. Potentate? Potate. Potato. Potato. <laughs> and of course, the dragons. Listen now, my hatchlings. When peace was made between dragons and elves at the end of our war... The riders were created to ensure that such conflict would never again arise between our two races. Queen Tarmanora of the elves and the dragon who had been selected to represent us, whose name... He paused and conveyed a series of impressions to Aragon. Long tooth, white tooth, chip tooth, fights won, fights lost, countless eating Shurg and Nagra, seven and twenty eggs sired and nineteen offspring grown to maturity cannot be expressed in any language, decided that a common treaty would not suffice. Signed paper means nothing to a dragon. Our blood runs hot and thick, and given enough time, it was inevitable that we would clash with the elves again, as we had with the dwarves over the millennia. But unlike with the dwarves, neither we nor the elves could afford another war. We were both too powerful, and we would have destroyed each other, the one way to prevent that and to forge a meaningful accord was to link our two races with magic. Aragon shivered, and with a touch of amusement, Glader said, Sephira, if you are wise, you will heat one of those rocks with the fire from your belly so that your rider does not freeze. Thereupon, Sephira arched her, arched her neck and a jet blue flame and emanated from between her serrated fangs and splashed against a scree, blackening the lichen which released a bitter smell as it burned. The air grew so hot that Aragon was forced to turn away. He felt the inse insects underneath the rocks being crisped in an inferno. 
After a minute, Saphira clapped her, clapped shut her jaws, leaving a circle of stones five feet across, glowing cherry red. Thank you, Aragon said to her. He hunched by the edge of the scorched rocks and warmed his hands over them. What does it mean if your blood is thick and hot? I'm guessing, like, um, battle-ready, like, warrior, Oh. thick and hot, like, dude, we'll fucking, we will do war again, because we are crazy people, crazy dragons. Oh. Bloodlust. Okay. Remember, Saphir, to use your tongue to direct the stream, admonished Glader. Now, it took nine years for the elves' wisest magicians to devise the needed spell. When they had... They and the dragons gathered together at Illyria. The elves provided the structure of the enchantment. The dragons provided the strength. And together they melded the souls of elves and dragons. The joining changed us. We dragons gained the use of language and other trappings of civilization, while the elves shared in our longevity, since before that moment, their lives were as short as humans. Oh, wow. In the end, the elves were the most affected. Our magic... Dragon's magic, which permeates every fiber of our being, was transmitted to the elves, and in time, gave them their much-vaunted strength and grace. Humans have never been influenced as strongly, since you were added to the spell after its completion, and it has not had as much time to work upon you as with the elves. Still, and here Glader's eyes gleamed, it has already gentled your race from the rough barbarians <laughs> who first landed in Alagazia, though you have begun to regress since the fall. Were dwarves ever part of the spell? asked Aragon. No. That is why there has never been a dwarf rider. They do not care for dragons, nor we for them, and they found the idea of being joined with us repellent. Perhaps it is fortunate that they did not enter into our pact, for they have escaped the decline of humans and elves. Decline, master? queried Sephira, in what Aragon would have sworn was a teasing tone of voice. Because, like, they're still yeah. s- abundant. I decline. If one or another of our three races suffer, so do they all. By killing dragons, Galbatorix harmed his own race as well as the elves. The two of you have not seen this, for you are new to Elismira. But the elves are on the wane. Their power is not what it once was, and humans have lost much of their culture and been consumed by chaos and corruption. Only by riding the imbalance between our three races... Shall our order return to the world? The old dragon kneaded the scree with his talons, crumbling it into gravel so that he was more comfortable. Layered within the enchantment Queen Tarmonora saw oversaw was the mechanism that allows a hatchling to be linked with his or her rider. When a dragon decides to give an egg to the riders, certain words are said over the egg, which I shall teach you later, that prevent the dragon inside from hatching until it is brought into contact with the person with whom it decides to bond, as dragons can remain in their eggs indefinitely. Time is of no concern, nor is the infant harmed. You yourself are an example of this, Sephira. The bond that forms between a rider and dragon is but an enhanced version of the bond that already exists between our races. The human or elves become the human or elf becomes stronger and fairer, while some of the dragon's fiercer traits are tempered by a more reasoned outlook. I see a thought biting at your tongue, Aragon. What is it? It's just... He hesitated. I have a hard time imagining you or Saphira being any fiercer. Not, he added anxiously, that that's a bad thing. The ground shook as if with an avalanche as Glader chuckled, rolling his great big staring eye behind its horny lid and back again. If you ever met an unbonded dragon, you would not say so. A dragon alone answers to no one and no thing takes whatever it pleases and bears no thought of kindness for aught but its kith and kin. Fierce and proud were the wild dragons, even arrogant. The females were so formidable, it was accounted a great accomplishment among the riders, dragons, to mate with one. The lack of this bond is while Galbatorix's partnership with Shruakin, his second dragon, is such a perverted union. Shruakin did not choose Galbatorix as his partner, he was twisted by certain black magics into serving Galbatorix's madness. Galbatorix has constructed a depraved Im- imitation of the relationship that you, Aragon, and you, Saphira, possess, and that he lost when the Urgles murdered his original dragon. Glader paused and looked between the two of them, his eyes all that moved. 
or his eye was all that moved. That which links you exceeds any simple connection between minds. Your very souls, your identities, call it what you will, have been welded on a primal level. As I flick to Aragon, do you believe that a person's soul is separate from his body? I don't know, said Aragon. <laughs> He's like, never thought about it before. Sephira once took me out of my body and let me see the world through her eyes. It seemed like I was no longer connected to my body. And if the wraiths of a sorcerer calls upon can exist, then maybe our consciousness is independent of flesh as well. Extending, extending the needle-sharp tip of his foreclaw, Glader flipped over a rock to expose a wood rat cowering in its nest. He snapped up the rat with a flash of his red tongue. Aragon winced as he felt the animal's life extinguished. When the flesh is destroyed, so is a soul, said Glader. But an animal isn't a person, protested Aragon. After your meditations, do you truly believe that any of us are so different from a wood rat that we are gifted with a miraculous quality that other creatures do not enjoy and that somehow preserves our beings after death? No, muttered Aragon. I thought not. Because we are so closely joined, when a dragon or rider is injured, they must harden their hearts and sever the connection between them in order to protect each other from unnecessary suffering, even in sanity. And since the soul cannot be torn from the flesh, you must resist the temptation to try to take your partner's soul into your own body and shelter it there, as that will result in both your deaths. Even if it were possible, it would be an abomination to have multiple consciousnesses in one body. How terrible, said Aragon, to die alone, separate even from the one who is closest to you. Everyone dies alone, Aragon. Whether you are a king on a battlefield or a lowly peasant lying in a bed among your family. No one can accompany you into the void. Now, I will have you practice separating your consciousness, consciousnesses. Start by... Um, Everyone dies alone, Aragon. That just reminded me of Fight Club. When he's like on a long enough timeline, everyone's survival rate drops to zero. Like, just that kind of... Nihilistic attitude? Yeah. Like, we all die alone. Like, nothing fucking matters. You're an animal. We're all animals. Are you really so different than a wood rat? Wood rat? You are not a unique snowflake. You are the same <laughs> decaying organic matter as everything else. You know what's actually really interesting? I just was telling you, remember that conversation I had with the girl at work about like if it, if I feel that like humans are more important than animals? I felt like that was very spot on. Mhm. Mm Aragon stared at the tray of dinner left in the anteroom of the treehouse. He cataloged the contents, bread with hazelnut, butter, berries, beans, a <laughs> bowl of leafy greens, two hard-boiled <laughs> hard eggs. Which, in accordance with the elves' beliefs, were unfertilized. And a stoppered jug of fresh spring water. He knew that each dish was prepared with the utmost care, that the elves lavished all of, the other, all of their culinary skill upon his meals, and not even Izanzadi ate better than him. Bitch. Shit, and he's still going <laughs> to complain about no meat? He can't possibly, after connecting his little brain to all the animals and the little creatures in the world, when he, like, like flinched when Glader... Yeah. It, like, he should get it now. I feel like he's going to start stopping meat. <laughs> you can just say stop eating meat. You don't have to nope. say start stopping. No, he's going to start stopping it. No. <laughs> yeah. He could not bear the sight of the tray. I want meat, he growled. Mm. Stomping back into his into the bedroom. <laughs> Sophia looked up at her from her dais. I'd even settle for fish or fowl, anything besides this never-ending stream of vegetables. They don't fill up my stomach. I'm not a horse. Why should I be fed like one? Sephira unfolded her legs, walked to the... Sephira unfolded her legs. She had her legs folded? Was she saying crisscross fucking applesauce? <laughs> Maybe. Walked to the edge of the teardrop gap overlooking Ellis Mirror and said, I have needed to eat these past few days. Would you like to join me? You can cook as much meat as you like and the elves will never know. <laughs> that I would, he said, brightening. Should I get the saddle? We won't go that far. Aragon fetched his supply of salt, herbs, and other seasonings from his bags, then, careful not to overexert himself, climbed into the gap between the spikes along Safira's spine. Launching herself off the ground, 
Saphira let an updraft waft her high above the city, whereupon she glided off the column of warm air, slipping down and sideways as she followed a braided stream through Dewald and Vard into a pond some miles thence. She landed and hunched low to the ground, making it easier for Aragon to dismount. She said, There are rabbits in the grass by the edge of the water. See if you can catch them. In the meantime, I go to hunt deer. What? You don't want to share your own prey? No, I don't, she replied, glump, grump, blah, 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 blah. No, I don't, she replied grumpily. Though, I will if those oversized mice elude you. <laughs> he grinned as she took off, then faced the tangled clumps of grass and cow parsnip that surrounded the pond and set about procuring his dinner. Less than a minute later, Aragon collected a brace of dead rabbits from their nest. It had taken, them, it had taken him but an ist- instant to locate the rabbits with his mind and then kill them with one of the twelve death words. He just fucking killed him dead. I mean, I guess he was a hunter before, but it's weird that he has that connection and like feels like feels that pain and he still is just like pew pew pew. What he had learned from Oramus had drained the challenge and excitement from the chase. I didn't even have to stalk them, he thought, remembering the years he had spent honing his tracking abilities. He grimaced with sour amusement. I can finally bag any game I want, and it seems meaningless to me. At least when I hunted with a pebble with Brom, it was still a challenge, but this, this is slaughter. The warning of the word shaper Runon returned to him then. I mean, you can have anything you want by uttering a few words. The goal matters not, only the journey to it. Hell yeah. I should have paid more attention to her, realized Aragon. Ha <laughs> should have paid more attention to her. What else could I think of back in the past that people have gave me advice on that I haven't thought about? Hmm, maybe mm. one of the countless pieces of advice Brom's given me. Literally anyone. With practiced movements, he drew his old hunting knife, skinned and gutted the rabbits, and then, putting aside the hearts, lungs, kidneys, and livers, buried the viscera so that the scent would not attract scavengers. Next, he dug a pit, filled it with wood, and lit a small blaze with magic, since he had not thought to bring his flint and steel. He tended the fire until he had a bed of coals. Cutting a wand of dogwood, he stripped the bark and seared the wood over the coals to burn out the bitter sap. Then spitted the carcasses on the wand and suspended them between two forked branches pounded into the ground. For the organs, he placed a flat stone upon a section of coals and greased it with fat for a makeshift frying pan. Safira found him crouched by the fire, slowly turning the wand to cook the meat evenly. She landed with a limp deer hanging from her jaws and the remains of a second deer clutched in her talons. Measuring Measuring her length out in the fragrant grass, measuring her length out in the fragrant grass, she proceeded to gorge upon her prey, eating the entire deer, including the hide. Bones cracked between her razor teeth, like branches snapping in a gale. When the rabbits were ready, Aragon waved them into the air to cool them. Just... Then stared at the glistening golden meat, the smell of which he found almost unbearably enticing. As he opened his mouth to take the first bite, his thoughts turned unbidden to his meditations. He remembered his excursions into the minds of birds and squirrels and mice, how full of energy they felt and how vigorously they fought for the right to exist in the face of danger. And if this life is all they had, gripped by revulsion, Aragon thrust the meat away, as appalled by the fact that he had killed the rabbits as if he had murdered two people. His stomach turned and threatened to make him purge himself. Okay, but now you've killed those animals in vain. You're just going to throw their carcasses in the dirt. He doesn't think that far ahead. Because then I think like, okay. He's just thinking like, oh, fuck, I'm about to eat these life. Fuck, what have I done? Too late. You already fucking killed him dead. Might as well make it not for nothing. Safira paused in her feast to I am with concern. Taking a long breath, Aragon pressed his fist against his knees in an attempt to master himself and understand why he was so strongly affected. His entire life he had eaten meat, fish, and fowl. He enjoyed it. And yet now it made him physically ill to consider dining upon the rabbits. He looked at Safira. I can't do it, he said. It is the way of the world that everything eats everything else. Why do you resist the order of things? He pondered her question. He did not condemn those who did partake of flesh. He knew that it was the only means of survival for many a poor farmer. But he could no longer do do so himself unless faced with starvation. Having been inside of a rabbit and having felt what a rabbit feels, eating one would be akin (laughs) to eating himself. (laughs) That's weird wording. Okay. He could have said just like being inside of the mind of a rabbit or something instead of being like being or inside like, of a rabbit. And like touching the mind of a rabbit. Literally anything else. <laughs> <clears throat> eating one would be akin to eating himself. 
because we can better ourselves, he answered Sephira. Should we give in to our impulses to hurt or kill any who anger us? To take whatever we want from those who are weaker, and in general to disregard the feelings of others? We are made imperfect and must guard, our, guard against our flaws lest they destroy us. He gestured at the rabbits. As Ormus said, why should we cause unnecessary suffering? Would you deny all of your desires then? <laughs> I would deny those that are destructive. You are adamant on this? I. In that case, said Sephira, not going to share any of my cocaine with you. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, said Sephira, advancing upon him. She going to fucking kill him? Jesus. These will make a fine dessert. In a blink, she gulped down the rabbits and then licked clean the stone with the organs, abrading the slate with the barbs on her tongue. I, at least, cannot live on plants alone. That is food for prey, not a dragon. I refuse to be ashamed about how I must sustain myself. Everything has its place in the world. Even a rabbit knows that. Not trying to make you feel guilty, he said, patting her on the leg. This is a personal decision. I won't force my choice upon anyone. Very wise, she said, with a touch of sarcasm. And I feel like that's the true meaning of the fucking chapter. Because it's like the beginnings of wisdom or what the fuck this chapter was mm -hmm. called. Right? All of that to get there. The beginning of wisdom is the name of the chapter. And I think like like surface level, you think like, oh, him being a vegetarian, ve becoming vegan, mm -hmm. well, vegetarian is like the like the wisdom, but I think the true wisdom there is I won't force my choice upon anyone. And that's when Safira's like very wise. Mhm. Mm but she also said it with a touch of sarcasm, so. I mean, also I feel like Christopher Paulini is like taking like jabs at people <laughs> in this book. Yeah. You know, like when Glader's like, you don't go anywhere when you die. I <laughs> felt like everyone dies alone. You know, Aragon, like it kind of felt like idiot. a stab at like anyone who believes that you go somewhere when you die. And just like how like abruptly he said, like the soul dies with the body. Mm hmm. Like there's, it's just, it is destroyed. He said, yeah. And then like Aragon being like, well, the I'm soul's destroyed with the body. If you didn't split your soul and embed it into an object. Oh, a horcrux then. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then like, then he's like, Oh, I'm going to be a vegetarian now, but I'm not going to force that shit on anyone else. Cause you know, like, I don't hate veganism, but I feel like every vegan I've next ever fucking, met. Next fucking Aragon's going to be like, yo, you got beef because I'm a fucking vegetarian. I'm not fucking scared of you. Oh, shit. You should write a song. Put those lyrics in there. I actually have another idea for a song about a girl wearing tight Daisy Dukes. But I can't, like, get the flow right of it. Mm-hmm. Like how I want it to sound. I just know I want it to end with a woo woo. <laughs> I think everybody would really enjoy it. I think it could be a popular song. I should name um, my band EOE. I think that's, I get it. And then I'll just kill myself. What were you saying? Aragon's going to be a vegetarian? Well, he's a vegetarian now. Yep. I also thought it was interesting. They they added in the eggs. I feel like Christopher, Pal Christopher Paolini is a vegetarian or something. And he's like, but it's okay if I eat eggs because they're not fertilized. <clears throat> I don't think, he, I don't, I don't know. Maybe. You know, I'm just looking into it too much. <laughs> you know, you know how I do. Stabs at people. Just stabbing every person. What's up with the blood oath thing? Is that going to be like a wild raging party or Another what? Another fucking orgy. Hell Yeah. So, what is the time? What time of year is it? Is it going into fall? It seems like because he said the cold air or whatever, and he was getting like chapped lips because it was cold. Well, they're up at about. Oh, I wasn't sure. But I think you can safely assume that they're coming around to the fall, right? It should be like the end of summer, I feel like. That's at least how I'm imagining it is the end of summer fall early winter because winter turns to spring turns to summer turns to fall yep fall <laughs> <laughs> no i was just trying to think of like when they left plancar valley mm -hmm. plancar valley 
and then they made it to the Varden when it was, and it was like after winter. Yeah, because it was, it was like, like s- just ending winter, springtime, and so has it been an entire year since Safira hatched for him, or it's only been like six months? Because right, he's like you're like six months old. That was a while ago, though. Like she should be almost a year old. Right, but what I'm saying is like when they got to do Weldon Varden, mm-hmm. he's like you're six months old. Right, which she hatched in the winter, so then it would be June. Mm-hmm. So then. I can't see them not being in Alice Mirror for like six months. So I feel like it would be like November. Cause it, maybe it, September. We'll go with September, October. Yeah. Cause then I was thinking like it would, since it seemed like he kind of lined up the like orgy festival with like early summer or like summertime, which is kind of like in, re- in other religions, like that's when they have their sexy time. In summer? Best. I thought that was a spring thing. Well, it's like spring, summer, like early summer. But it's like, I mean, it's his made up world. So he could have just like changed that to like summer. And then, I don't, I don't know. Listen, I don't well, know I'm not is. finished. Just let me finish. And I was going to say that it would be cool if the Blood Oath Festival was like around like Halloween time. Ooh. Well, it's not really like a. I know. But I'm just saying, blood. Halloween. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right on. Yeah, that'd be dope. Everybody dresses up in costume and like trick or treats. But they say, uh, prize or die. Oh. <laughs> prize or death. Either give me a prize or fucking kill me. Because my life won't end. Ever. Sweet. Well, thank you everyone so much for watching. <laughs> If this story has convinced you to go vegetarian, let us know in the comment section below. Yeah. If you're a vegetarian, vegetarian, <laughs> vegetarian. How did you become a vegetarian? What what was it that sparked the vegetarianism for you? And we'll see you in the next one. You don't ever think about animals like being alive at one point and then you're just eating them. They're dead. They're dead flesh. Nope. I think about that sometimes. I don't usually think a lot about anything. Mm. I just cram food into my face mindlessly. I mean, but like.